Hello and welcome to another edition of Storytelling on Orchard Street. I'm your host, Pete Salamita. We're in the PNT Knitwear Bookstore podcast studio on Orchard Street. It's a great bookstore. They have a great selection of books and events and this podcast studio. Uh, with me is CEO Moed. She grew up on New York's Lower East Side when it was still a tough neighborhood. An alum of the infamous Wow Cafe, her work has appeared in the Silver Tongue, Sil- sorry, Silver Tongue Devil anthology, Awake, Reader for the Sleepless, Mad Hatters, Thorn Literary Magazine, Unexpected Stories, Sensitive Skin, and Inspirational Art Magazine. My Private Coney, her 10-year blog from 2006 to 16 about New York City, has been featured in Jeremiah's Vanish in New York and excerpted in various online magazines and websites. It was her New York true stories and big pictures about dementia, gentrification, undying love, old lesbians, and family is being published by Rootstock in February of 2024. Welcome to the studio. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. And we should... Um, I'm going to be transparent with the audience that we did this in May yeah. and uh, unfortunately um, had problems with the video. So we're going to do it all over again. Can't wait. Yes. And I'm going to say that that was a, one of my favorite episodes. So I was really bummed out it didn't come out. But guess what? <laughs> this is going to be even better. <laughs> it's lightning. This, lightning can strike twice. It's this, the lightning is going to be so <laughs> intense. We're going to have to wear sunglasses. I'm ready. Okay. So, I have a lot of information here <laughs> to talk to you about. Um, so, obviously, uh, if anybody's read your blog, and I hope they have because it's a great blog, and I can't wait for the book. It's, it's looking so beautiful. Right. Uh, I can't wait either. February okay. 13th. Cool. And, um, and basically, uh, you grew up here in this I neighborhood. Can't. I did. Uh, talk about that. Well, I grew up on Grand Street and Columbia. Right. Or actually, I, my window faced Boom Street in Columbia. And um, we lived in an amalgamated dwelling, which was a um, union-built uh, socialist housing for working class and lower middle class like us. And right. uh, I went to PS 110 down the street on Broom Street. And I went to junior high school 56 on Henry. And... My family grew up on Henry Street. My father lived on Henry Street. My mother moved from Bushwick to Henry Street. She taught at the Henry Street Settlement. You know, we're very rooted into New York City. My, both my grandparents were in Knickerbocker Village wow. before it became famous. I mean, we were here before the neighborhood was fancy. Right. You know, the joke was that you know, the, all the poor people lived on the Lower East Side. It's you true. Know? There yeah, was, was a lot really, of poverty. You know, there was a lot of poverty. We were, I always say I grew up in a good part of an, a bad neighborhood because we had an elevator wow. in our building, and we didn't have rats in the apartments. We had rats well, outside, right. not rats inside. Right. Well, as long as I stay outside, it's yeah, not so Yeah, as long as I stay outside. Right. But my father grew up in the tenements on Henry Street, and, you know, they talk about the rats that were sized as dogs. And and he actually told me he worked in a sweatshop on the corner of um, Broom and Grand, uh, you know, the Broom Street, you know, Grand Street with on Columbia, I guess. And he said that they wove baskets, and when the inspectors would come, they would have to hide because they were children. They shouldn't have been working. Um, you met uh, Serge, the uh, general manager here. Mm-hmm. Um, did you ever talk to him? Because he grew up in this neighborhood. He too. grew up in this neighborhood. I yeah. talked to him briefly. Yeah, yeah. 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 He's he's much younger. Oh yeah, so. right. But I mean, since you you know, you've only yeah. been here for probably a few times. Yeah. Um, I know for him, it's probably really weird to be working in a bookstore, managing a podcast studio in the neighborhood that he grew up in. Uh, what's it like for you to be here and to, uh, and also see the changes? It's mixed Uh it's you know i want to recognize what feels like home and i think one of the reasons why i started the blog was that as gentrification began to really change a culture that i didn't grow up in i began to look for where my home still existed and it existed everywhere it existed in shops it existed in the people on the across the counter it existed on the street i i found these little moments of home right you know that and it's not like I, it's my neighborhood and not yours. It's like, it's my neighborhood, come into it. This is also part of, it's wonderful when you have, you know, a new influx of young people right. and ideas, changing the neighborhood, creating new businesses. The old neighborhood is there for a reason, and it should be, you know, celebrated and respected right. and incorporated. 
So I began to write about where homes still existed, where my New Yorkers were. Right. You know, just to share, just to feel connected to home. And home for me is really important. Right. You know, so looking around the neighborhood now, I'm still kind of shocked at all the new cars. There's a beautiful SUV outside. <laughs> you, you know, know? there's a pizza, pizzeria across the street that's voted the best in the world. Yeah, I, yeah. That's I mean, so it's like, like, you, know. you know, we went to Aldo's and you got a, a dollar slice. You right. were lucky. Right. Um, and Aldo's was on East Broadway. Right. So I, there is this this kind of feeling of all these young people coming in to celebrate the Lower East Side and also especially P&T Network where right. I really feel like this is exciting. Right. Where we have young people coming the, in saying, what's New York? This is a good um, sample of what gentrification can can do because it's very community-minded here. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And it's very great. accepted and... Yeah. And I think, like, I know that a lot of people my age and around my age who grew up in the same period of time that I did, we have stories, and we also have street moxie, and we also have, you know, survival mechanisms, and we have things that we can share that should be part of the New York culture. And so part right. of writing the book and part of reading, you know, at these different reading series is to say, you know, here's, here's how we live. Right. And not just lived Right. live. Right. This is who we are. Come on in. There's so much to talk about with you, um, uh, both the, your past and what you're doing currently in this book. Uh, this book is the main yeah. the main thing we should talk about. And so it's, um, you're talking a little bit about the history here, um, but the, so the the part of the, um, the book and uh, of course the um, where, where it came from, the uh, blog, is a juxtaposition of um, you growing up you know, obviously with your family, your mother, uh, mm. your experiences here and what the Lower, the lower East Side was about. And at the same time, uh, gentrification and um, the decline of your mother's mental health. I think when, when my, so Florence was a, um, someone who was raised in poverty and was a Juilliard graduate, which is a big deal for someone who comes from our origins. Right. And, and was it also a big deal because she was a woman at that time? Yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah. You know, and she was, you know, unfortunately in the closet. I mean, right. she was in love with a particular person for almost her entire life, as uh -huh. that person was in love with her for almost her entire life. And that book certainly, the book certainly holds that love story in its core. Um, so I think, I think when, I, when she began to sort of fail and disappear, you know, New York was also becoming more and more gentrified. Right. And the, the moment I started the blog was the moment I walked by some kid in a pork pie hat uh -huh. talking to a camera that his friend was holding in front of Ray's little coffee shop, you know, where you get the best egg creams and fries. Right. And he was saying, what's an egg cream? I mean, is there an egg in it? And I just, Ugh. I thought, I'm going to fuck. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, and that's where I thought, let me tell you what New York is. It's right. not something to be snide about. An right. egg cream, you I know. love a good egg cream. A good egg cream. I used to stop, um, like, when I uh, first moved uh, to Brooklyn in 79, there was nothing in Brooklyn. No right. restaurants, right. bars, music scene. I know. It would yeah. be hard for anybody um, now because, you know, young people now are living here because there's so much to do in Brooklyn. There's no reason. Yeah, Brooklyn to, is, is yeah, a lot. Especially certain, like Bushwick and, mm. and Williamsburg for music and, and stuff. Sky. But we used to come in all the time for bars or whatever else we mm -hmm. were doing. And we would, um, on the way back, we would stop at um, Dave's. I was um, going to say, did you go to Dave's? <laughs> yeah, for Kanish and an egg cream. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. You know, that, all you have to do yeah. is buy um, Fox's You Bet. Chocolate syrup, which still exists, <laughs> and to make your own egg cream. And I there's know. no egg in egg cream. No, you got to have the right seltzer. Yeah. Uh, well, really, the seltzer does matter. Yeah, it really yeah, does. Right. But, uh, um, I think one of the things about as the neighborhood began to change and Florence began to disappear, the other thing that happened was that there was a part of her that just wasn't disappearing. And that's also that there right. was a part of New York that wasn't disappearing. And I went... They're still there. Right. And the stories that I wrote for 10 years was about her still being there and New York still being there as things changed. And I loved that. I right. love how we hold on to who we really are, no matter how we are eroded by time or by money or by development or by illness, that we're still who we are. She was who she was to the very end. So talk about your relationship with your mother 
um, early days because obviously there was a lot. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, when you're uh, raised by an artist, it's a lot. Right. Yeah. And, she was and an you artist. have a sister. I have a sister who's a semi-pro violinist. Did I get this wrong? Did I not read um, in your blog? Because I, w- I was trying to review some of the stuff because mm. um, I-, I did my homework the first time and <laughs> I was trying to make sure I didn't forget stuff. I think I read an, a story about your mother uh, in your bedroom and your sister. Um, your mother was hitting your sister. That is a, that. It's actually a, it's a short uh, piece called "Last Night," and right. it was published in an, an anthology. It wasn't. It's not on the blog. Right. There was a lot of unhappiness when mm. you're when you don't get to be who you really are. Right. Then you, it's not like you're going to really enjoy life. And both my father and my mother didn't get to be who they really were. And it was because at that time there were quotas for Jews all mm-hmm. over the place. Right. And she was a woman and there was no such thing as gay liberation. Right. That happened in the 70s. Right. And she was a part of that too. We can talk about that later. Yeah. Yes. I mean, she, right. she came out, you know, when she was 58. Wow. Um, God, why did she wait so long? Right. Because, because it's still, it, was, yeah, it was, took that long no place for acceptance. To, yeah, yeah. There was no place to be safe. You right. could still lose your job. Right. You right. were considered a mental illness. I said people now don't get that. At all. And how wonderful that there's a generation that's saying, you have freedom to marry because mm-hmm. we were arrested outside of Stonewall. Right. Um, so I think... So I know that there was there was a lot of unhappiness in the house, and at the same time, and I want to really stress this, I was incredibly lucky. Right. I was raised by a woman who knew what it meant to be an artist. Right. She was a professional musician. She taught music all her life, and I saw the discipline up front every day of how you sit down to do your art, period. You sit down every day. You're talking practice. about her pa- practicing the piano. Practicing. But she, did, she didn't really, well, like when you were a kid, she, she didn't really perform out. She did, did perform. A little she, bit? Oh, okay. Yeah, she did. She, per- she performed with um, uh, trios, quartets. Uh, she was an accompanist. She did some solo work. She had stage fright. Oh. And there are now drugs that you can take for stage fright. Uh-huh. Which is okay. amazing. Just for that purpose? Just for that yeah. purpose. Like, okay. I mean, musicians have, stage fright can be, I right. think Vladimir Horowitz used to throw up before he yeah, went Yeah, I've heard people you know, that, are, that you would be surprised to yeah, have that yeah. problem. Yeah. Um, one of the last big concerts I heard her play, it was a modern piece. I, I can't remember who. What the, who the composer was, but she was so nervous that she started the after the intermission that she had to walk out onto stage and hold onto the piano, and then they raised the curtain. Oh. And the playing, it was at the Henry Street um, Settlement House okay. Theater, and the playing was heavenly. Right. There was there was an element to it that transcended the music. And I think if she had been a woman now... She, she could have had a better she career. Could have had, she could have had an right. enormous career. Right. So for her, it was just a passion and wasn't... No, en- it was... Uh, I mean, you can't... No, it right. wasn't enough to help the family financially. No, no. We, we, well, I mean, you know, no one makes a whole lot of money doing anything in art these True. days. Yeah. Or, or any day, mostly. <laughs> right. Unless you're like, like Taylor Swift. <laughs> yeah, that would be really There's nice. extremes, aren't And there? that's a lot of work. And she yeah. has a huge, you know, business that supports that. Right. Um, no, she did not make money doing it, but she taught for 50 years at okay. Henry Street Settlement. Right. So the music did pay. Yeah, it, I mean, it yeah, did pay something. Way. Right. I think, again, like I've had women writers specifically tell me that the, of how they never felt affirmed by their families to do what they were doing. Right. And I never felt that. My mother was like 100%. My father was 93%. Okay. I mean, there was such an understanding that for me to do art, to me uh-huh. to become a writer, that there was no question. And you knew early on that's what you wanted to do? No, I think oh. you know, my mother handed me a book when I was about 12. I was about to be an au pair girl on Fire Island. She said, you know, I used to keep a diary at your age. So I began writing a diary. Oh. She told me to write a diary. Right. I didn't know I was a writer until I went to the Wild Cafe. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. It was so it was later. all the years, but I wrote a diary all the time right. and very bad poetry, right. which everyone should do at least <laughs> once. You should have 10 years of bad poems somewhere. I'm, I'm going to have you read something uh, soon, oh, yeah. soon, but let's just um, tie yeah. things together a little. Yeah. So then, so then um, there's so many things to tie together. I don't know where to go. Um, but so you said you didn't become a, a writer until later. What did you do from childhood to I was playing adulthood. the violin. Right. I, I, we were raised as a musician family. Mm-hmm. My sister and I Do you ever play now? No. 
Okay. No. <laughs> yeah, no, when I walked out of the conservatory, uh, I walked out. No violin in your house? No. Okay. No <laughs> violin in my house. Right. <laughs> and which was great. That wasn't uh, that wasn't how I was supposed to express right. the story inside me. There are musicians who tell a story when they play. Right. I wasn't one of them. Okay. Um, but did you go to college? Or, I yeah. did. I went to the city college, which mm-hmm. is where my father went and where my sister went. And if you go to the NAC which is North Academic Campus Plaza, you, there's a, a little plaque with our name on it. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Cool. My mother went to Hunter. She right. was a Hunter girl. Okay. Uh, so I went to City College for both my bachelor's and for my master's. And, and I have a master's from NYU, too. Right. But the bachelor's, I started in the music conservatory program. I started in the jazz program. I was, ah. a jazz, I was studying ah. jazz under John Lewis of the Modern Jazz Quartet. Ah. I was really I love bad. Modern <laughs> jazz Quartet. I know they're wonderful. Yeah. He was a great teacher. Oh. I was really bad. Okay. I was, I was, I, you know, I, I don't, I mean, I don't make any. Well, jazz is a whole it. different thing. It's one thing to to play um, composed music, mm-hmm. which is its own challenge. Yeah. But then jazz is a different I, thing. I came Not to everybody ja- is no, good no. at it. I came to jazz from bluegrass and right. old-timey, you know, right. where you're playing whatever you want to play. And, right. and I heard jazz all the time. My mom once took me to a big sing. You know, there were all these, like, you know, singing these great operas. And it was uh, the whole New York community with, you know, and I'd be jamming. And she'd be, like, furious that I was, like, you know, riffing on Mozart. But right. it was like, that's what I heard. Right. But I couldn't translate it into the violin, which was fine. So right. I switched over to theater. And okay. I, I, I was a performer. Mm-hmm. And that's when I got involved with the Wow Cafe, which was on 11th Street. When, when, when would that have been? 1982, like what oh, 81, okay. 82. So you, you go back a long time in, in the yeah, arts community and the, the poetry community. Yeah, all right. I do. And we had, so I was organizing festivals. I was performing in all these wild shows that were offending people, but were tons of fun. Right. And uh, we had a slot. I remember we had a Friday night slot, and we had to fill it. And I said, I'll, do, I'll write something. I've never written anything in uh-huh. my life. I wrote a short play. Cool. Yeah, yeah, wow, about my family, about being raised by a musician. Uh-huh. I love that I was taught that discipline by her. It is the greatest gift she gave me. Right. And she understood my writing, and she understood the process of my writing, that she actually trained me of how to be a writer every day. Mm-hmm. And I do write about that in the book. It's in right. the book. There's a story about having to be trained. Right. So and February is coming out next February year. February 13th, right. 2020, 2024, Rootstock it, Publishing. It's um, coming out just in time for somebody to buy that as a, as a, as a, a Valentine's Day. It's game. a perfect <laughs> Valentine's Day present. Yeah. Look, you win love, you lose love, but you still love. Right. And... The story, which is hilariously funny and incredibly sad, but it's also about Florence teaching me to persevere no matter what. Okay. And to hold on to the love that you feel or that you stand by. Mm-hmm. So it is a perfect Valentine thing. I mean, everyone would love Valentine's Day to be this happy romantic rom-com with the sunset going down. Right. Everyone knows that's not how it happens. No, and it's not for most people anyway. <laughs> it's not. Everyone walks around with a broken heart. Right. So, which Once is a perfect. Something. It's a yes. perfect segue to right. the story. Perfect. This is one of. This is the first story. Sinatra's dating advice. Florence is refusing to do much but lay in bed. I say, fine. You don't want to get out of bed? Then go lay down and die. She yells, lie down, lie down, not lay down, lie down. I said, you can't get out of bed but you can still correct my grammar. She yells, yes, it matters. I yell, then get out of bed. She doesn't. I look at her butchered hair. That's because the week before I took the household scissors and chopped off big chunks of it. I did it because it was a huge halo of wildness, so thick and silver sparkling. Now it was a huge halo of wildness I got caught in a buzzsaw. Oh, let me, sorry, the page is stuck together. Old lady, old lady uh, bookmark. The Sunday afternoon all-you-can-eat jazz radio show begins. We settle in to listen. Sinatra comes on. He's singing blues in the night. She sings along. My mama done told me, woman is two-faced, cry in the night. Now, knowing something of her dating history, I ask her if that's true. She says, I didn't make it up. That's what's written. I start laughing. She asks why. You're singing with heart. She shrugs. I'm just trying to get the words. And then she, who broke many hearts of many old girls and garnered many angry love letters and hurtful looks across crowded dances put on by the local gay and lesbian senior citizen center, she looks up and asks, is it true? 
A woman is two-faced? Nice. So um, when did Florence and your father uh, separate? I would say it had to be 76, wow. 77. So it was that long yeah, she stayed. Yeah. yeah. There wasn't a framework for people to be who they were if they were gay. Right. And the gay liberation movement, which was early on, mm -hmm. was very new and people were considered freaks. Right. Yeah. It's hard to imagine that. Um, so um, how, did, how did that affect um, the family's life? I mean, Well, I was already out of the house. I right. had left early. My sister was already out of the house. She had left early. Right. And um, my father, you know, moved. Right. You know, they got a divorce. It was not amicable. Right. She and a girlfriend moved in with her. Uh -huh. And she, you know, she began her life as, a, as an almost out woman. But look, on the Lower East Side, when you're surrounded by conservative people, right. it, it was difficult. And right. yet she, I really love this about her, that she just kind of like, no matter what, she just stood for herself. I wouldn't say she was a confident person. She was a very fragile person, but she loved who she loved. And I got a, so I got a phone call one day, when she, in, and it was an old neighbor, childhood friend of mine. She said, your mother, she looks terrific. I don't know who that woman is, but your mother looks terrific. Hmm. You know, like throw the fishing line. I'm going to tell her. Right. <laughs> and right. I, of course, I wasn't. You know, no, so of course. I, you right. know, I just, right. yeah, she's doing great. Right. Click. They, the neighborhood. I mean, it's a small neighborhood. My friends used to joke, "You come home late, your mother knows about it right. the next day." Well, you know, so everybody knew everything, and she, she lived as out as she could. When she turned 60, I'd gotten her a ton of books about being older, being gay, specifically mm -hmm. a lot of really cool lesbian books were coming out then. And she said she would tuck them under her, her sofa when a student came to study piano with her. And okay. when they left, she would just pull them out and right. read them again. And I'm really, I just feel like that was like well, one good thing I did. What did it feel like to, for you? I didn't care. Okay. And I mean, I liked girls too. Right. I liked boys. I liked girls. Also, a difficult thing to do in those days. Right. And the Wow Cafe was primarily some fabulous, some of the most fabulous lesbians around. Mm -hmm. But I mean, were you happy for her? I was uh, thrilled for her. Right. And I wanted her to be happy. But did you know before? We suspected. Right. I suspected. Um, there was little tiny pictures of this woman that we knew was the ex-lover's name, like, you know, she's not out, she's died, but her family was never told. Oh, So I, wow. you know, I don't wanna, but we knew who, I mean, we'd say, who's she, right. who's she? Did you meet her? I met her. But, uh, I mean, while you, while you were growing up? No, not, okay. not that I remember, but right. I did so meet her as a young adult. Did your mother adult. spend time with her, like separate from the family? They, they had a tumultuous in and out friendship. Right. They were teenage lovers, uh -huh. and then, you know, this ex-lover said, time to get married. Right. We're getting married. So they both got married. They she was married, married too. They were both married too. They okay. both had kids. They reunited after Florence came out in the 70s. Oh. And that's when I met her. Right. And it was the, one of the few times I ever saw Florence. And had that uh, woman uh, be separated from, you know, Yeah, no, sure. her husband had died or oh, they okay. divorced. I right. don't know. She was on her own. But I do want to say, you know, I saw my mother as a person because she was fully who she was with right. this woman. And that was the only time I ever saw that. Mm -hmm. The rest of the time, she was someone battling the world or trying to survive the world. Again, when we love who we're supposed to love, we become who we are. Right. Or we step into who we are. I don't think we become it, but right. we, get, we get to live who we are. Sure. It makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I think, I, and for me, it, it doesn't matter, you know, about when I was coming up, it was much more... Um, rigid you know you, had, you were gay or you were straight and bisexual women were confused right uh -huh. <laughs> but you know i was like i hate the word bisexual but i felt like i used to joke i'm a slut for love okay you love me i'm going to consider it because i wanted to be loved right. and right now i mean i had a eight-year relationship with a woman who i'm still friends with who okay. still stays with me and my husband right and i met this man you know when i was 53 and married him you mm -hmm. know so Ted, Ted mm -hmm. who's a great writer right. and he and my ex Joni are very good friends oh. and they like all the same things and they gang up on me on a regular basis oh, so that's i'm just great. putting a public <laughs> <laughs> protest to right, that right, right. now yeah. yeah well i'm glad that you have that for you for i yourself. again like i got lucky i, I guess your mother was a um 
a, not a mentor, but I mean somebody you could see. She was a role the, model, yeah, right. but not, not by trying. Right, right. She just did what she had to do. She wore sneakers when people didn't. She roller skated before everyone roller skated. Right. Up and down Grand Street, people laughed at her, and then all of a sudden, roller skating was the thing. Right. You know? Yeah. 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 She was. A, she was a visionary. One story I liked from uh, the first time we talked was uh, about how she bought the concert pianist. Uh, the, uh, uh, the piano. I'm sorry. How the, she bought the piano. The piano. Yeah. yeah. Tell yeah. The, tell that. The um, no, you're talking, you're talking about like where she she saved all her money. Right. From thought, from waitressing right. at the white. She waitressed during the war uh, at the white. A tavern or the White Horse, which was on University Place. It was a posh restaurant. And I think it was on D Day or V Day that she had enough money. She bought herself a. I thought she also, maybe I'm remembering wrong, I thought she also worked at Grossinger's. She did work at yeah. Grossinger's as a, as a young woman, yeah. <laughs> right, right. She, worked at, she worked at all those, you know, uh, uh -huh. Catskill places. Right. Yeah. And, you know, uh, was a waitress and had, I think she was at that point still kind of wild and free. Right. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, she earned money being a waitress. Right. She, at Grossinger's, there's a story she told us where she didn't quite understand kosher laws. I mean, she went to Hebrew school, okay. but none of us are religious. Right. None, you know, we're just secular, cultural, artist Jews. Her Russian background, all my Russian relatives are artists right. and pianists, painters, you know, jazz musicians. So she didn't get quite get the kosher laws. So I think she tried to bring a glass of milk into the meat restaurant and Mr. Oh, no. Grossinger right. chased her around with a knife, you know. <laughs> But how great is that? Right. She's just like, okay, I'll give the kid a glass of milk. You know, she was, there was a fearlessness about her for someone who was really, you know, battered. Because that's a, another whole uh, interesting culture to me, her Lower East Side and, and the Catskills. The, yeah. The, well, the, we never the went. The Borscht Belt. The Borscht Belt. <laughs> she, we were there. No, I know. You she was there as a me. servant. Right. And I never went to those right. places. Right, I know that. I My husband that. did. Yeah. You know, oh, okay. Like, wow, you, you had a nice life. Right. You know, they were, they had money. Yeah. They had, which is like, they had middle class money. Right. You know, we had, our idea of a holiday was Coney Island. Right. Or I remember like twice we went to Atlantic City. Uh -huh. I was like, whoa. Well, I, I grew up uh, one of seven and my father was, uh, he didn't even finish high school. So mm -hmm. um, we didn't do those kind of vacations either. No camps or, you yeah. know. Yeah. We, we did like staycations, which is a, a popular term now. But, uh, you know. <laughs> Before it was just yeah. being broke. We, we, we did <laughs> rowboating on lakes in, right. on Long Island, or we came into right. the city once in a while to see a movie. You know, yeah. that was a big deal going yeah. into New York City right. from the suburbs, you know. Yeah. Florence yeah, so. got, got me into all these city programs. The city had some great summer programs. And I, so I was on, in city programs mm -hmm. for like most of I went to camp twice, oh, but it did. was the Educational Alliance camp, oh. as my friend said, for the poor Jews. It's right. <laughs> like, okay, uh, yeah. that's what yeah. we are yeah that was fine so um how about you read another piece i would love to i'm going to read a piece actually about orchard street cool. uh it's called irene we recognized each other immediately no matter that we were slogging along on treadmills at the gym of an elite university no matter that we had gone to different grade schools no matter that we'd grown up blocks away from one another in different parts of the lower east side no matter that she was chinese american i was jewish american no matter you grow up Below Delancey Street, you can spot that Lower East Side moxie a mile away. Irene still lives down there with her husband and son in the high-rise apartment buildings a block away from where Florence lives. One rare morning, we grab some coffee from the neighborhood luncheonette. It's hard for my friends to understand how it could be so fantastic to live a less than idyllic life on the Lower East Side among projects and tenements and gangs and having to watch your back, she remarked as we strolled down the street that we grew up on, now much nicer and safer. Well, it's true. Back then, everything felt alive and normal and real and every day. When you were punching someone or you were getting punched, it was still real and alive and normal. And when I left the neighborhood and explored the world, something was always missing. Maybe it was that moxie. Stopping in front of one of the last remaining Notion stores, we both recalled that there had been a billion stores like this up and down Grand Street and all over Orchard. Even though my family didn't shop in these places often, I mean, because buying something new was a rare event, I knew these old stories from tagging along with my friends and their mothers when they went shopping. They only look chaotic, but really they're quite organized with those ladders that roll up and down on the wall of shelves and all the hair accessories stapled outside each box. Thousands of products, Eileen said. And you have to ask for what you want. I mean, I still got my stockings here. I can't find them anywhere else. We both peeked in. The counter people eyed us suspiciously. Ah, oh, that familiar customer service you can only get on the Lower East Side. 
We shopped at Orchard Street every other week. I mean, I don't know what my mother was buying, but every other week, Irene continued. The Jewish owners, they paid us no mind. Just let us poke around and look at everything until we were ready. I mean, it wasn't like we were dressed nicely. I think it was because we were Chinese and they liked us as customers. Well, things were different now. A subway sandwich was across the street, fancy glass apartment buildings were sticking up from behind every tenement, and a cafe that sold one cup of coffee for three times what our coffee cost us at the luncheonette took up the whole corner. The old Notion store was now completely out of place, a relic from long ago. A handwritten sign in the window said, no pictures. I don't think that stopped tourists from snapping away because the store was just so old and unusual and exotic looking. I wanted to take a picture, not because it was so old and exotic looking, but because I wanted to capture one last portrait of my childhood before it disappeared into thin air. Quick, stand in front of the window and, and don't move until they tell us to move, I told Irene. She obliged. But not before checking if the coast was clear. Turning to me, she said, I'll tell you what Orchard Street taught me. It taught me to negotiate. Those Jews didn't respect you if you didn't. If you didn't, they were insulted. I mean, these, these, these days, I don't bargain. There's no one there to bargain with. I snapped a couple more pictures real fast, and then we both skedaddled before anyone complained. You know what else, she said? My friends and I wandered the streets incessantly. People watched out for one another. My mother never worried. When I was seven and in second grade and my brother was four, my mother walked us to the municipal building. We went under the turnstile and we took the sixth Lexington train to visit my aunt in the Bronx, a cruddy part too. My mother and father worked six days a week and sending us to spend five to seven hours at my aunt's hand laundry store, I mean, they needed the break. Now to anyone else, that sounded crazy, but to me, I knew exactly what she was talking about. From the time I was in grade school, I ran wild on the Lower East Side, all the way to City Hall. And as little kids, my sister Louise and I walked to and from Knickerbocker Village in Chinatown on Friday nights to visit our grandma. Walking home along Madison Street at 9 o'clock at night, no big deal. It's just what you did. Irene shook her head. I mean, if I put my son on the 6th train to the Bronx, now I'd be arrested. Our coffees were done. It was time to do housework in Florence care and get on with things. Just as we were about to say goodbye, Irene paused and then said, do you know that everyone in our building calls your mother Florence, the music teacher with the fancy scarf? <laughs> nice. So uh, did, uh, let's talk about, so you had the blog, you had all, all this wealth of um, material already written. Um, did you write anything else or is it just to make the book or did you mostly just take this and form it? Both. Like, Okay. I pulled a lot of stuff from the blog. I, you know, I wanted to, I don't, I wanted to pull together a story about home. Right. And it seemed to really be about the moment that Florence really began to fail and New York began to disappear and how in that beautiful arc of walking to your death, there was still incredible beauty, mm -hmm. incredible love, hysterical funny things that she said. Um, it was still home, and it was also a process of loving and healing and taking care of someone and seeing New York City step in and take care of someone. Mm -hmm. She was taken care of from day one of, of being an old person in New York City. There was so many people who stepped in to help her, and as she got weaker and weaker— Is that because she was a— did, was she still in this, in this neighborhood when she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh, absolutely. So that's or if, why. If, or she was traveling uptown, or right. she was got lost on Third Avenue, right. or if you know, bus drivers who helped her onto uh -oh. the. I mean, people, and that's what New Yorkers do. We all. Right. I mean, I I do that. Uh huh. And, you know, I, I saw a woman struggling out by in front of a hospital with her walker. I said, "Do you need help?" She goes, right, "I need I to get too. my jacket on." Right. You know, yeah. of course you do it. Right. There is a New Yorkers interact with each other. Right. And I would urge anyone new to the city, interact. Right. Don't be a jerk. Just say, can I help you? You lost, right. you know, or great outfit. I do a lot of, because there's so many well-dressed people. I was like, that's a great outfit. You know? right. So So how's the book organized? Is, is it read as a novel or it's just um, like... It's not a novel. Right, okay. Uh, every story's true, uh -huh. I swear. No right. matter what anyone says, it really happened. Um, it's only well, I mean, I mean, it's a, is it is it a continuous story or is it like uh, short stories or? It's a continuous uh, story in short right. stories. Right. With, and there's photographs in mm -hmm. every single story. It's I, I called it a picture book, uh -huh. but you know, it's it's um, an illust it's almost like an illustrated um, movie frames. Nice. 
So it starts with Florence and it goes, you know, it just weaves in and out of right. memory. You know, it's like, I remember old stuff. All right, here's a new thing that happened. Are there here's a lot a, of old photographs? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a lot of old photographs. That your family took? Some yeah. of them are my family. Some of them I took. Because, uh-huh. you know, I'm old, and I took them a long yeah, time ago. Right. So now they're old. Right, right. <laughs> you know? But it's all, it's all generated from from you guys. Not, yeah. yeah. I've, um, I think there's there's a couple of... The, I was really lucky to know um, one of the most wonderful lesbian photographers, Morgan Gwenwall, a real groundbreaker photographer. And so uh, one of the pictures of Florence is a picture she took of Florence at the Gay Parade, huh. which I love. Nice. So we have we're including that in right. the book. Um, there are some pictures that we suspect the ex lover took. Mm-hmm. Wow! You know, uh, and there's I mean, and there's also there is a, a tradition in New York City of taking pictures in photo booths, and which you can't yes. find anymore. But if you go to like you went to the Five and Dime, yeah, you, well, we you, always did that. Yeah, you yeah. get into the photo booth. So there are strips of photos, and I found all the strips of photos of her and right. the ex lover. Huh? Yeah. yeah. It was just. There's also a, a tradition that I don't see anymore where, you know, I tons of pictures of her and the ex-lover feeding the pigeons, and there are pigeons up and down her arms hmm. being fed. Very normal. Right. You know, now no one feeds. I mean, you see people feeding the pigeons, but you don't see them on their arms. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, so um, what was it like? Um, what, was your relationship generally good with your mother on and off or no (laughs) so you know i think there's this thing about women and mothers which is really you know everyone has a mother and we all have complicated relationships Mm -hmm. with them and so it's not really a female thing but i think women are much more willing to talk about the dynamics um florence and i were very similar Mm -hmm. and she actually would yell that you're just like me right which was not a compliment (laughs) so um we were both, uh, you know, stubborn and because uh, because she said it when you, when you were arguing. Yeah, she or said it when she, we were not arguing. Oh, okay. You know, she she said it, yeah, you know, right. repeatedly. Right. Um, I think you know we all have complicated relationships with our parents, and they inf- that relationship informs us mm-hmm. in so many ways. Um, when she got sick and my my plans were suddenly derailed, I had a lot of stuff to work through. Right, and I'm really lucky that I had great friends and a strong structure of a Buddhist practice that helped me work out how pissed I was that I was suddenly not doing what I'd planned to do, but I had to take care of my mom. Right. And I did, and it healed me. Right. And it healed her. That that when I found the peace and the grace and the compassion to see her as a person not as someone who failed me as a parent, right. but see her as the vibrant person who lived a life not the one she wanted. Right. It opened up my heart, and it opened up the world. Um, to look at a parent as only a parent is not fair. Right. And the reason why we call her Florence is that on Mother's Day, when I was about 12 or 13, she said her, that the gift she wanted for Mother's Day was not to be called Mom anymore. Right. I, we rarely did. So we called her Florence. You know, it's interesting. You said what you just said about looking at our parents as not, not just our parents. It's hard to do. Um, I uh, found a photograph. I think my sister had it and must have given it to me. It was um, a selfie that my father took of him and, and my mother um, in a mirror. And it must have been, I don't, I, I don't know how I would find out, but it, it, I have the feeling it was probably before my my oldest brother was was born or shortly after i mm-hmm. got the sense from how young they looked yeah. and um and i actually i don't have it with me i think i read it on one of the previous mm-hmm. um podcasts but i wrote a poem about it like um you know i i said wow who, who are those people i mean i know that's my parents but i don't know them then i don't know them when they had um New love and uh, no, no responsibilities, you know. Care, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I only know them as the people that you know raised me, worked hard because uh, um, you know seven kids. <laughs> they were both always working. Yeah. You know, um, and then seeing them later in life, uh, and then having a different view, or you know, um, I, I helped both my parents. Uh, I had lucky. I had two. Uh, I, a big family, but two sisters that helped quite a bit. Um, they didn't really have dementia, but you know their health declined in the mm. in the last years. Uh, my mother had many strokes, mm. so it was similar in some respects because she would forget things or say things mm-hmm. that wasn't characteristic of her. But um, uh, 
so I know it's like a, to, to a degree of um, have, having to see your parent, your help your parent in a different way than you. Right. You know, I'm I'm going to I'm going to be 65 really soon, and I think. Oh, you're that just a youngin. I'm just a youngin. <laughs> I'm going to be 66. Oh, oh, you're so in two much weeks. older. Two weeks. <laughs> happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Um, but I think like at 65, she was had been living her own life. And it's also at the end of the possibility for having the career she wanted and having the love she wanted. And she was still so intrepid. The dementia started at what age? I don't know. Oh. I don't know. I think probably in the 70s, probably right. in her later years. You know, right. she died at 84, so I'd say late 70s. Right. But she was, there was a, a or, there was a group of uh, classical musicians, uh, lesbians, and she, they performed for one another. Uh-huh. She was very active at it. She was very active in senior action in a gay environment, Sage. Right. She was really living her life, and she was really expanding into who she was, even though her life had disappointed her, right. that she hadn't had the life she wanted. And I see people of all ages, as they get older, getting more and more embittered huh. because they didn't have the life that they had dreamed of. Right. She, she used her disappointment in amazing ways because she never gave up. Right. She sought love, she sought fun, she sought dances, nice. she sought performance. She swam at the 14th Street Y, not the fancy McBurney, but the right. Educational Lines one. Mm-hmm. She was a vibrant person who walked up and down these streets at all hours, you know, eating junk food because it like our idea of like fast food was like exotic to us mcdonald's right. and, we never you know, went there those oh. hardly ever went to those kind of places yeah, growing up. Like, yeah. oh my god like a right. mcdonald's burger but also fast food wasn't as big a part of the no, culture at wasn't. all but she, well, she was really yeah. into it right but i mean like when we were growing up as kids yeah. and, and after it was really started more in the 70s, 70s. I think. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. She just, yeah. she just, she <laughs> just, this was like, whoa, So wait, wait which one was her favorite? Um, it's the, it's, it's uh, Wendy's. Wendy's. She loved Wendy's. Okay. I'm like, okay. Yeah. That's great. Uh, I think, you know, like I love that she was still running around the city on her own terms. Mm-hmm. And it taught me that even though I felt totally insecure or, such a lack of confidence. I still ran around on my own terms. That's what I got from her. She was intrepid without knowing it. She right. did not understand how amazing she was. And I'm glad that at the as she got closer and closer to her demise, that letting her feel that amazingness was, you know, a delight. And she was kind of puzzled by me. Mm-hmm. She just thought like I. She didn't realize like. I could do things, and so there was a delight in seeing her be delighted or confused right. when I did something she didn't know anyone could do, I, you know, like fix something. Right. You know, you know, duct tape is an amazing thing. Oh, yeah. She was always impressed. Right. Was fun. That's good. Yeah. It's nice to impress your parent. I, I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Or I really impress did. Impress anybody, right? Yeah. Well, it really helps when you can impress your parent. True. Um, do you mind if I read the... Uh, I would love it. Okay, so I wrote this... Um, I promise not to cry this time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote this after, uh, before our episode, after I did research on the episode, and I was inspired by um, what you wrote. And this is called Faded Memories. Mm. Ruby retreated into herself after all these years. She kept pain locked up and fought showing bitterness from everybody else. Maybe because she was named for a jewel. It was in her nature, showing the shiny but hard edge, rather than showing her tender and darker side. But she grew up tough. It was part of survival. The mean Lower East Side streets weren't kind to those who didn't know how to fight. But that was a long time ago, and there aren't that many people left from those days that can attest to what it was like. In a neighborhood that had character and moxie and learning was listening to stories from Holocaust survivors and history was taught every day in fabric, storefronts, hat stores, and deli counters. But most of those places are just memories now, faded Polaroids, pages of journals, and what was passed down notwithstanding. So Ruby walked slowly up the street, feeling like she was in someone else's reality, not recognizing the surroundings she spent eight decades being a part of. She would nod gracefully to those who took the time to notice, her slim, tired, and aging profile, trying to hold on to what dignity is left when everything in your life feels as if it is declining. Was, um, was that part of it for you, like um, the, the idea, um, like um, 
oftentimes um, when somebody's battling dementia, my, uh, battling is probably not the, the right word, living with dementia. Yeah, living with dementia. Um, or where dementia is slowly eating their brain. Right. Yeah. And in the beginning, I would imagine, especially when it's early on. Uh, it was a little confusing. Yeah. And also, she wasn't particular. I mean, she was so she was so ferocious. So, she, you know, the names. She was forgetting names of famous people. She was a voracious reader. We just, I'm going to just pull this back. Oh, sorry. You're a little off mic. Sorry, okay, sorry. thanks. She was, um, she was a voracious reader. She was a voracious moviegoer. I, she sent me to Truffaut, mm -hmm. Fellini. Um, who else did she send me to when I was like 12 years old at the Elgin Theater on 8th Street? She said, you, you have to go see these. I saw a man and a woman in Hiroshima Mon Amour when I was 12 years old, you know, by myself. Right. That's what we did. Yeah. She, she was really, a, she was curious. She was an artist who was curious about life. And so, you know, she began to forget names of the artists or the writers or the performers that she loved. Right. And we found, so she would write them down, and we found pages and pages of these names, uh -huh. because she was trying to keep her brain inside right. her head. And that, to me, shows, I mean, she would say, denial is not to be sniffed at. I love that, that she was so determined to hold on to right. her own cognitive self that she was going to write down every name she suddenly remembered. But did she know that she had this? She knew that something was wrong. Oh, okay. But she never um, admitted, absolutely right. not. But there was never a formal diagnosis that she had to come. No, to we with. we had to get a formal diagnosis. Right. I mean, right. you know, we were take, going to the doctors, and we you know we got but her on. Was that probably a, later on when it was already? It was obvious. when it was really like she couldn't take care of herself, and right. that did not go well. Right. <laughs> you know, so. And then what, for her? Uh, we made sure that she got twenty four hour Medicaid. We right. were very lucky. Mm -hmm. we one of the few people that were getting it during the Bush administration. I don't know what it's like now. But we, we had 24-hour care for right. her in her home. It's called Community Medicaid, and it was to keep her out of nursing homes. Right. People do better in their homes. They do better in their homes, and to be honest with you, it's less money. It's, it's less it's, money. It's, 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 it's less money to have 24-hour care. It's, uh, my, fa my father had at one point. Mm -hmm. um, and we're thankful, and he... We got lucky. Like the, um, the the aid was like an angel. It was yeah, I mean, crazy. We, had, we had amazing. Because that's women. important. You can get a bad aid. And or, my sister know. and I were amazing. Right. The, the aids actually told us that you know a lot of families don't participate with the no, care of their to. parents. You have to be like, part of I it. I couldn't imagine. No. You know, and it's not like Florence was like, oh, I love my mommy. It was like you show up and you take care of your parents. Yeah, you have and to I do, do it. With my dad too. Right. You right. Know? Yeah. So, um, you know, she knew that something was wrong. We almost lost our Medicaid application because Florence could still play the piano. Huh. And so oh, they, were, they, were, they were bewildered by how she could sit there. I think she was playing scales. But isn't scales. it true that um, people with dementia tend to have that, like, skills? There's well, certain things they, they remember <laughs> that, and some things they according don't. According to Medicaid, no. Uh. <laughs> but we, we went, I mean, we appealed. But I, I thought music was actually something very, uh, like, yeah. a, a, something very... E that, that's held on I, to strong. The I'm studies sorry. that they're doing around dementia and Alzheimer's are still so new that it's not necessarily incorporated into how we evaluate someone for care. Right. And so when she sat down at the piano and was playing her scales, it was bewildering to people who were observing her. Right. But she knew how to play scales. At th we knew it was really bad when she couldn't read music anymore. Right. And we also knew it was bad when she stopped sitting down. Uh -huh. So that was... In what do you mean, stop sitting down? She stopped sitting down at the piano. Oh, sitting down at the piano. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Right. No, she... My, Florence told me that there were only two days that she didn't practice. Mm -hmm. When John F. Kennedy, the president, got shot, huh. and when her mother died. Huh. And those are the only two days she didn't practice. Huh. It's, a, it's a tough standard to live up to because sure. there are days I don't write. You know, I know. Like, oh. uh, I can't think of this. <laughs> I don't think there's anything I've ever been that dedicated to. <laughs> well, that's but yeah. that's where that was my role model. Right. You work at your art, right. No matter what, and I had a sense of, uh, this is not my favorite word, but I had a sense of entitlement that I get to be a writer. Right. No, I did not get married. No, I did not have kids. No, I did not go into a career that wasn't writing. You know, I found jobs that supported the the who I was, and that's not usual mm -hmm. and if you do it it's not like you got parents saying thank god you didn't become you know <laughs> a poor struggling no no uh, i mean well parents uh, say to their kids you you know get a get a something to fall back on like being a right. lawyer or a doctor right. you know my mother was like don't well, uh, you okay. get out there and you be a writer that's awesome and she right. was also a great critic of my work uh, okay <laughs> and also a great critic of my work um 
why don't you read something? I would because look, we're getting towards the end of the show. I want to make sure you get... Well, this is certainly piece. about yeah. going deeper into care. Okay. Not Coney. Coney Island. Oh, I love this one. Florence is not only refusing to get out of bed, but she's refusing visitors everything but her back. Kay, the recreational therapist, managed to get Florence to turn to her by playing a sonatina really badly on her portable electric keyboard. Annoyed by sloppy playing, Florence rolled over, corrected Kay's mistakes, and then rolled right back into her little corner. Kay didn't give up. She began mispronouncing composers' names badly. Florence rolled back over and began a lesson on how one is required to speak and how Debussy is supposed to be pronounced. A couple of days later, finished with my swimming lesson, which went actually swimmingly, I did not drown, I looked down from the glass balcony at the gym's pool filled with bodies going back and forth and recalled a recent conversation with the ex-lover, the woman Florence had loved all her life, the woman who had loved Florence, her Deutsche, all her life. They had first found each other when they were so young they still had hope, but were old enough to recognize passion and desire for one another. Decades later, they reunited, but only briefly, both too old to change their ways or heal from a lifetime hiding from love. A while ago, I located the ex-lover's number and address in Florence's papers and gave her a call to catch her up on things. As thanks, she sent me a recipe of a spice applesauce cake that she got from my grandmother, the one who hated Florence. You know, at the time, it seemed like a fair exchange. Now, no one knew Florence like the ex-lover. Your mother, my Deutsche, oh, such a great swimmer. Your mother, my Deutsche, could swim anywhere. Your mother, my Deutsche, oh, we went to Coney, and boy, could your mother, my Deutsche, swim. And she went out, way out. And then, your mother, my Deutsche. Now, I knew Florence and Coney went back as far as Florence and the ex-lover. I mean, years ago, before we knew her memory had begun to fray and she was hiding accidents and mistakes behind closed doors, I got Florence to talk into a microphone about the place she loved more than her piano, Coney Island. Staring at the swimmers below her, I thought, I, I wonder if I could coax Florence to roll back into life. So I called her. I said, hello, Florence. I, I just finished another swimming lesson. I used to go swimming. I swim, Florence said. I know, in the ocean. I had to shout this because she had, again, forgotten how to hold the phone to her ear. Right. And then you sit on the boardwalk and watch the people, and they see you alone, and they try to strike up a conversation. Get out of bed, and I'll take you to Coney. Not Coney. <laughs> it's Coney Island. Coney Island. Get out of bed and I'll take you to Coney Island. Okay. Maybe tomorrow. Don't eat too much and lie down. And with that, she clicked off to roll back into her own deep waters. Nice. I love that one. I remember from, you read it the last time, I believe. Yeah. Do you have the one uh, about the bras? I don't actually. <laughs> I like that. One. But it's 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 in a, in a nutshell, and my friends and I still talk about this on Orchard Street. There are these tiny little bra stores where you are sized up, usually by the Hasidic families that are running the place. With you know, the men kind of glance at you and they can figure out what you, what size you are, and the uh, the way that they the women sized you was very um, hands on. So we would walk, I, my first bra experience was that I walked in and the way that I got sized for a training bra was that the woman put two hands on oh, my gosh. baby tits and, <laughs> and then pulled out a bra. And it happened to me as an adult. And that story's in the book I as well. I, I love that one. Yeah. <laughs> and right on Orchard Can you imagine something like that happening now? Oh my uh, <laughs> Well, I mean, I, it, I mean, it happened, you know, I guess 10 years ago. Right. So now it is. Okay. But yeah. I actually look for that. But it happened 10 years ago in a, in a place that's right in, down the street. Ancient, though. Yeah, right. Yeah, ancient. Right. No, no, you don't do that now. <laughs> but it was also a Jewish cultural. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it was Jewish cultural. But I do remember I was walking home one night by St. Mark's Church. And one of the old waitresses from the Second Avenue Deli, when it was on 10th Street and Second Avenue, was coming off her shift. And I recognized that she was like really old, bright red dyed hair, lipstick that went over her, you know, lip line. And she was walking towards me, and I, I knew who she was, but I didn't go in there that often. Mm -hmm. I went in there once a year. She looked at me, and then she grabbed my tits, and she went, nice tatas, and then walked <laughs> off. <laughs> so clearly, you know, yep. different world, yes. different time. Yeah. So you've put a lot of yourself into this, and I'm sure it's going to be great. I, I can't wait to, to read it and see, see the book. Um, have you had the time, 
or the inclination to write anything else? Yeah, no, I, I wrote uh, I wrote a trilogy that um, I'm going to rewrite, and I have tons of trilogy sh- of uh, uh, just a story of a young girl, okay, uh, New York based in three parts, in three parts yeah. of what it means to you know find home. A lot of home, you know, it seems to be in my. I left my house when I was. Uh, 15 and Mm -hmm. lived with relatives and then I found my apartment when I was 17 and I've lived in the same apartment for 47 years so you know wow yeah that's incredible (laughs) well I didn't the joke I mean it's not even a joke it's true I didn't know how to drive a car so I didn't know how to leave New York because you have to know how to drive a car (laughs) I got my license when I was 39 years old right you know, yeah, so I and that was just well, you a lot know. of people didn't drive cars. Who in, in, I didn't even know people city. who had. My cars. wife never learned to drive at all. Tell her to <laughs> stay the faith. Well, she's not gonna. She's not gonna change. <laughs> so if we were to move outside of New York City, it would have to be someplace else that it's you really, can walk to. My walk. my husband grew up in New Jersey, and he's a great driver. Uh-huh. But you know, I, I he was driving. You know, at sixteen. I gotta be honest with you. I hate driving here now. It's gotten so bad. This always, I mean, it was always bad, but driving in, in, New York, in New York City or trying to get out of New York City, you're just always going to hit traffic. It doesn't matter when it is. I know, but that's Except where I'm good. Maybe like 3 o'clock in the morning, maybe yeah. there's no traffic. We were driving. And I'm trying to teach my son, who's 20, yeah. how to drive. And I grew, I grew up learning in the sub, right. suburbs. Right. It's horrible trying to teach him here. It was like. The only, so I got my license at 39, and Joni, my ex lover, and I were going to drive up to Vermont, eight hours away for a wedding, you know, family wedding. And um, I was great in New York City traffic. Huh. I could, like, fuck you, fuck you. you know? but, but, but are you driving now? Nope. No, no was, that was many years but that's ago. That's what I'm saying. It's gotten worse yeah. because oh, now, know, right? you got um, scooters, e bikes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Other bikes, you know, it's just well, um, there's so much to pay attention to. It's almost impossible. It's it is it is it's a horrible. bit more crowded. I yeah. mean, I was a bike messenger. As a matter of fact, everybody in my family. Oh, I we, forgot about that. Yeah, yeah that's so crazy us, to see you as a bike messenger. I was a bike messenger. <laughs> we, I was riding a bicycle in the New York City streets from the time I was 12. Right. And so I was, you know, I ride like a fish in water. But I, I ride. I've been riding bicycles since I moved here in yeah. '79. It's yeah. horrible now. It's okay. so different. Well, I, I can't. I'm not allowed yeah. to get on a bike because I'm, I'm and, a bit and, Dog. And I think I'm less afraid of the cars than these. The, oh, than the, the e-bikes, I really well, like the, the, scooters the scooters. Are worse because those yeah, are like vehicles, scooters. and they and they drive fast, yeah. and they go in regular traffic, and then, and then they get when it's them. and into the um, bike lanes too. Well, that is the change of culture, right? Because we suddenly have a world that lives on delivery. Everybody orders everything all the time. Uh, that's and, uh, right. It's really bad. And these guys yeah. who are usual immigrants are busting their butts no they have to do they, they have, have to be to fast to make their money i understand yeah. them yeah but it doesn't mean it's you know, <laughs> that's, i know i yeah. know it's like that's uh, that's how i would be i was a i was a total hot dog on the bike so we're at the end i have to say um i think this episode is better than the one we I'm couldn't so use glad. Yeah. no it's always yeah. it's always wonderful you know what? to talk to you i listened back to it as but as you know even though the volume the volume mm. was uneven and uh, I felt like I talked too much. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'm trying to get better at like the, the less I say about myself is better. In the well, show. I think that's look, that's New York language, right? You know, we we over talk each other constantly. We're talking over each other. We're interrupting each other. That is how New Yorkers talk. I do want to plug something though. Go ahead. Um, about so I started. I uh, did one so far, uh, doing a variety show. Oh wow! Uh, at Young Ethel's, which is four or five blocks from my house on Fifth Avenue in Brooklyn. Yeah. Okay. So I'm really happy. <laughs> um, and I did it originally just because, I, I'm, you know, I do a music project, um, poetry and music, and I wanted a home for that. Like, I wanted to be able to, to get that out. I mean, I have done features. I just did one Thursday night with my friend Fred Genziano, mm. uh, uh, the Neuronautic oh, yeah. uh, Institute. Yeah, at, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But so I said, you know, I want to get out and do other places. And they gave me an... Uh, so I, I booked a show in... Uh, December, <laughs> it was October. Sorry, um, and they gave me an hour and a half, and I'm like, okay, if I. And, but they also said you have to bring people, yeah. and I had a, a, a minimum I had to bring. I said, well, if I do this by myself, I don't know if I'm going to bring that many people. I said, oh, yeah, I'm going to do a variety show. So I, I uh, luckily somebody I work with is a comedian, and he was the host. And then I I booked two music acts, two poets, and a storyteller. Wow. Yeah. You know, you know, so, that sounds wonderful. Uh, so we're doing another one, uh, December 9th, Saturday at Young Ethel's, uh, th- uh, 3 to 5. So it's a matinee. You can do your chores, come to the show, and then go out to dinner. And uh, the poets are George Wallace and um, 
uh, Pauline Finley. Oh my God, I love yeah. Pauline. Yeah, uh, oh, well, well, the, the I love Pauline. Yeah. Got it. And enjoyed. <laughs> so um, I just want to tell you, like how small New York is. Uh-huh. Matthew Hubert runs the thing at Autos that you went to. That's why I'm. Yeah, I yeah, didn't yeah. get to say his name, yeah, but Matthew. Matthew. Hubert, Matthew he's a, he's wait, a, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Matthew Hubert's brother, Daniel Hubert, is a lawyer who protected me from getting evicted, and we nice. changed the wow. laws in New York City. We right. made the first roommate law in New York right. City. That's how small the world is. And that was in this, the 80s, wow. 81, is 80, uh-huh. or something like that. Before we end, I want to end on one more New York story. Okay. Real short and sweet. Sure. All right. Okay. And, and it's called The Secret of the Fruit Man. For the first time ever, the Fruit Man by the Avenue A bus stop on Clinton and Grand was closed. Well, the first time, not a Jewish holiday. His fruit stand, an outside pyramid of overflowing old boxes piled onto the sidewalk and a beat-up space inside for the stuff that couldn't stand the heat or the rain or the snow, was just like all the other fruit stands in the neighborhood. But while the rest dissolved into fancy supermarkets and gourmet coffee shops or Chinatown where fruit sold out of their shipping boxes still meant something, the fruit man stayed on Grand Street. Everyone in the neighborhood loved him, even Florence, who hated him. (laughs) Irene, my fellow Lower East Side girl and Florence's neighbor, loved his cantaloupe. I knew he couldn't have been evicted. The city sold the building to the tenants so everyone could stay there without being kicked out because they weren't rich. So I called Irene. Where's the fruit man? He retired, Irene said. Really? Why? Was he sick? No, he was 90. Wow. He was mean. No, he wasn't. (laughs) He yelled at everybody. Irene cut me off. All his customers were old and hard of hearing. That's why he yelled. That's great. That's New York. It definitely is. Well, speaking of Fred Argenziano, um, my partner in crime, um, I write the poetry, he does the music. That's him on guitar. Uh, C.O. Moed, I want to thank you so much. Why C.O. and not your... And not your full name. Claire Olivia is a very pretty name. I do. I love that. Yeah, name. I know, but okay. no one takes me seriously. Oh, okay. And, and also, I sign I all my. I, I t- thank you so yes. much. I sign all my checks, CEO. I sign all my paperwork, CEO. So, it just yeah. became CEO. Sounds, it's official. It's official. More official. Uh, you've been a great guest, a second time. Thank you. <laughs> I'm hoping a third time. We've both gotten better with age. <laughs> Well, you're so much older than me. I know. Oh. It's, 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 I know. I'm I so hope. sad about that. Yeah. <laughs> You've been listening to Storytelling on Orchard Street. Um, I'm Pete Salamita, your host. We're in the podcast studios of P&T, P&T Knitwear. A great store. Yes. Come check the bookstore Come out. Come see a New York City bookstore. Thanks store. for listening. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good night, folks. <laughs>